or coming to our, our life. I think in today's world, by and large, it's a few billionaires and the the media executives by the by the number of a hundred, I guess, uh, who are working for these billionaires. I'm sure you you know what I'm talking about. The this the major media companies been repeated again and again as if China, you know, is a big terrible place where the people are suffering and stuff like that. It doesn't help. On the other, I would say, as a result of all of that, you are seeing a lot of Chinese people reacting very strongly and very negatively towards the kind of rhetoric that's coming from the United States and other Western countries, hence the very unfavorable. Hello and welcome to Infer Talks, a podcast where I put you in the room with some of the biggest thought leaders from around the world. Joining me today to offer a Chinese perspective on recent developments between the US and China and fears on competition between them. Pakistan-China relations, and our own journey in the media sector. My guest today is the host of The Point on the CGTN, Ms. Lucian. Lucian, welcome to InfoTalks. Thank you for having me, Osama. Lucian, right after your graduation, you joined CCTV English News Service as a news anchor. You also spent around six years in Geneva as CCTV's bureau chief, uh, and you later came back to Beijing uh, and joined CGTN as a leading anchor uh, since 2017 for the show The Point. Uh, let me ask you, as one of the leading anchors and as a woman journalist, what kind of obstacles did you have to overcome along this way? Thank you for having me, Osama. It's always good to talk to my Pakistani friends. Um, let me make a small correction. When I joined this organization, CGTN was not there yet. CGTN was officially um, established at the beginning of 2017. Back then, uh, I was still working for CCTV, which is uh, still there, but it's the Chinese language TV channel. So uh, I was working for the English language service. Um, since then, it's been 25 years. It's a, an amazing journey, I must say. And it's very interesting you mentioned the word woman journalist, I suddenly never thought of that, that aspect, at least whether it makes a difference for me to be a woman journalist or, or, or some other journalist. I just thought of myself as a as a journalist, um, maybe because of the kind of education that I was given while growing up, the kind of family upbringing I was given by my parents, and also the social environment I grew up in. Um, we were told, or I was told, and like many of my peers, to just go for it. You know, there was nothing like, you're a girl, you can't do this, or you're a woman, you can stay at home or do something minor. For me, the sky is the limit. And my mother always said, go for it if you want it. So for, so I tried what I wanted to do. I came into the TV station after I won a international public speaking competition. And I was a news anchor for immediately afterwards. And I did news present, presenting for 10 years. Then I said, okay, I'm, I'm bored of that. I wanted to see the world. So I went to Switzerland, as you said, to be an overseas correspondent. And again, being a woman never held me back. As a matter of fact, I think being a woman gave me some soft touches, let's say, when I was going for a difficult story. For instance, when I was looking for uh, interviewees after major terrorist attacks, I think the fact that I was approaching from a very soft and very compassionate perspective um, made people open up to me. So um, I, I thought it was a, a great experience. In terms of limitations, of course, there were the physical limitations, but I tell you, Zama, you've been in the news business for many years, I guess, and nowadays there is nothing holding back the women, the female cameramen, for instance, they can they can carry very heavy equipment, camera, tripods, you know, live views, and they run as fast as their male counterparts. So it's amazing what females can do in this career, and I'm very privileged that I've been given this opportunity. Um, I, I, on top of that, I would like to say that although being a female did not prevent me from doing my job, um, I do see limitations as, as a human being. And that's what I constantly f uh, strive to overcome. For instance, our limitations. And I keep thinking of that because um, we all try to do a better job, but what's holding us back? I think these are common things. I don't know about you. For me, uh, for instance, old habits, yeah. lack of knowledge, um, prejudice, even the lack of um, 
uh, vocabulary sometimes because because I'm speaking a foreign language and vulnerability, negativity, uh, impatience, even egoism, all of that constantly try to prevent us from doing a better job. So today, as much as 25 years ago, I'm still finding it very challenging and, and there is still always a lot to be learned and a lot to build on what I've already been able to accomplish in this exciting journey as always. Now, Lucian, let me bring your attention to another important aspect. And this is about, you know, media reports about, uh, you know, how the media is reportedly uh, set to operate within China. And it, this has to do with, you know, uh, the media being controlled by the government. Uh, how has your personal experience been uh, on that front? Uh, and what's your outlook as a journalist uh, while, you know, while reporting or speaking on different issues? Appreciate that you were very careful in the framing of your question. You said it's reported or you reportedly that China's media is controlled by the government. I think that is um, the, the prejudice. That's also the, can I say, the uh, the understanding a lot of people have about the media here in China. But I want to turn the table and ask the question, who really control the information that coming to our hand uh, or coming to our, our life? I think in today's world, by and large, it's a few billionaires and the the media executives by the by the number of a hundred, I guess, uh, who are working for these billionaires, and I'm and I'm sure you you know what I'm talking about the this, the major media companies that control the main TV stations, the print media, and of course, <clears throat> excuse me, the billionaires who are controlling the social media platforms we're all accessing. So in that regard, we are actually very much being controlled, and I'm not saying reportedly we are being controlled by these few billionaires who are constantly feeding us with their traditional advantage and with the onset of new technologies such as algorithm, a kind of narrative that they believe is the right narrative. And very much we are being uh, influenced and I would even say constantly brainwashed by that kind of narrative that the West, that the Western products or Western ideas or Western mentality is good, is better, is the one to dream about, to, to emulate. And I think in the you know, given that circumstance, what China is doing is to have its own hands on this whole media ship, let's say, so that it's steering to the direction that it believes is right. By that, I'm saying that China wants to have control of its own narrative and what kind of information its population is accessing. And I think that is the responsibility of every responsible government is to make sure, is to provide the kind of leadership and make sure that their citizens are being provided um, quality, responsible information. Um, I want to say that uh, some people don't think this is the case, but if you look at some of the more important surveys about trust in the media, and I'm referring to this one by this uh, global PR company Edelman, they did the latest trust barometer survey in the year 2023. And what they found out is the Chinese people have extremely high trust in their government and in the media. That is 90% trust in their government and 80%, almost 80% trust in the media. That is the highest in the world. And it is worth mentioning that this is a long-standing, continuous survey. They've been doing this for 23 years. And uh, also given the fact that the Chinese people, many, many of them have the opportunity to access information outside of China or to travel and see places or even live abroad as they wish. So they are able to compare and judge the kind of information they are getting from the Chinese media. So this extremely high level of trust by the Chinese people, I think, tells us a lot about whether the Chinese government is doing the right thing by providing that kind of leadership I was talking about and uh, whether uh, it is effective and whether it caters to the need of the Chinese population. By contrast, if you look at the trust by Western populations to their media, it's extremely low. Actually, according to the same survey, it's the lowest in history, almost hovering away around something between 30 to 40 percent, where, for instance, in the United States, people say 30 to 40 percent, people say they have no trust in the media 
at all. So I think by answering this question, I'm trying to challenge the traditional perspective or understanding that China or the Chinese government is controlling the media so that people don't really have, you know, the kind of quality information they 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 deserve and they need. Whereas in the West or in some other Western style societies, the media is free or people can, you know, can set up their own media. So the media landscape is better so that they're more trustworthy. It's not the case. I think people probably need to have a better or different understanding of the situation there. Now, Lucian, let me bring your attention to another important development that took place last year. And this was you know, the meeting that took place between President Xi and President Biden uh, at the San Francisco APEC 2023. Uh, both sides continue to have you know, a different outlook uh, in terms of avoiding the confrontation between the two countries. President Biden said, and I quote, we do not want the competition to wear into a conflict. And he said, uh, perhaps stressed of managing competition responsibly. While President Xi said that major country competition is not the prevailing trend of current times and cannot solve the problems facing China, the US and the world. Do you think, can the US and China pragmatically manage each other's expectations and fears about this possible uh, competition? I would say absolutely they can and they have to because none of us is going away. We all have to find a way to live with each other. So we've got to find a way to manage this relationship. And hopefully there are ad outs in the room. If not across the Pacific Ocean, definitely on China's side, there has been a very measured response and very rational approach to this relationship and consistent as well, despite the kind of changes uh, in the political scene in the United States. I would break it down into differences and commonalities. And I wanna start with common, what is in common between the United States and China at this moment, uh, when it comes to this relationship, I think they all want to, they all want this relationship not to go into a kind of uh, relationship of conflict. They want to manage the differences. But the difference is China believes this relationship shouldn't be defined by competition, whereas the United States wants to define this relationship by the word competition. In other words, to the United States, and this is my interpretation, to the United States, this relationship is about us versus you, whereas for China's relation, for China, this relationship is very much about us and you. So there is the very big difference. Why does China refuse to define this relationship as one of competition? Because that is a different tone. That sets a different atmosphere. When you are rival, when you're competing against each other, that means you are antagonizing each other. And that is not just problematic for the two countries because they have very close woven, woven interests and interactions, but also for countries that are uh, in other parts of the world, such as Pakistan, for instance, if China and the United States are competing against each other, you will be expected to say, okay, do you support China or do you support the United States? And I guess a lot of people don't want to make that choice because they don't think they should make that kind of choice. And it's very interesting that the United States, um, you know, tries to see China, tries to define this relationship as one of competition. Um, then it begs the question, how does it set, you know, the tone of its international relations? For instance, does it characterize different countries by these are the, our competitors, these are our, our friends, those are our allies, those are our cooperation partners? Um, so on what, on what general standard, on what rules is he setting his foreign policy? And that is not fair for the country that don't want, as I said, don't want to pick sides. And that, that is confusing as well to what, you know, that provides a lot of uncertainty. So I think at this moment, um, China is not going with the United States, despite there are certain elements of competition between the two sides. China does not want to frame this relationship as, as one of competition. Um, the, the difference, the difficulty thing is in the United States, there seems to, to be this Chinese bogeyman uh, mentality. Uh, if you look at some hawkish members in the Congress, for instance, in the, in January of 2023, there was this so-called um, tough on China committee that was set up in, in the House. And then President Joe Biden also signed into law 
the uh, National Defense Authorization Act, which sets 900 billion US dollars in military spending for the year 2024. And again, to counter China or to create a kind of deterrence against China is a big part of it. So on that uh, basis, it is um, not going to be a very easy ride, even after the San Francisco summit between the two countries. And I think um, China and the United States will still have a lot of job to do. But on the other hand, I think after a, a tumultuous few years of uh, trying to find a way to deal with each other, both sides have come to a certain understanding that they, at least they've got to talk to each other. And that is a great thing that they're doing. Uh, I'm also very happy that uh, what came out of San Francisco was also the understanding that there needs to be more people to people exchange. Just starting at the beginning of this year, since a couple of days, visa applications for Americans visiting China have been simplified. People don't need to produce their hotel reservation proof or, or airfare booking uh, proof and so on and so forth. And there will be 50,000 US students to be invited to visit China over the next couple of years. And the number of flights between the two countries will be significantly increased at the beginning, in the early half of this year. All these are very important steps to manage the differences that can't be wiped away in the short uh, period of time. And I think uh, these are all welcome news, but let's let's see whether this these efforts can be kept in place and that the United States will not go back and forth in their approach to China. Christian, let me collect more thoughts on this from you uh, on your trip to the United States. What was your own personal uh, experience? Uh, how did you find uh, the public in the U.S. and uh, different officials that you might have interacted with and the communities that you might have interacted with uh, in terms of you know, relations with China itself? Uh, so what was your pulse? What was your reading of, uh, of the visit itself? It's a very interesting question. I was in the United States during the APEC summit, and I put a particular emphasis on people-to-people -people ex exchanges. I went and talked to university students, faculty members. I talked to um, people from all walks of life. I was on. Um, I was interviewed by two subnational TV stations. One is ABC Bay Area and the other is NBC Bay Area. I also visited a Chinese factory, a Chinese invested bus maker in California. And so, and I talked to people in a farmer's market, for instance, just to get their views. And I was very relieved, I would say, that uh, at least in California, people are rational about this relationship. I had a vox pop on the streets of Santa Monica to ask the people about their expectations for the summit, which was upcoming back then. And I was pleasantly surprised that those who were willing to talk to me were reasonably optimistic about the two leaders coming together and sitting down and talk despite their differences. I think it was a very good sign. And the people that I talked to in university or in the media organizations also gave me the impression that they were friendly. They were very friendly, maybe because it's me, I was very friendly to them, that they, they were very open to me. And I was touched, I would even say. Um, before I went to the United States, I was, I was reading a lot of press reports on China you know, or watching TV or listening to radio. And the impression I got was very negative. So I was very frustrated and sometimes even angry when I was doing shows, when I was talking about US-China relations before I went to the APEC trip. After that, I have a better understanding and I feel a lot of people were not by instinct hostile to China. Their opinions were swayed and they were limited by their lack of information or comprehensive information about China. And I have a renewed sense of hope that if we continue or if we uh, can do a better job in providing them with a kind of information about China, things can change for the better. After all, the people want the same thing. They want a good life. They want peace. They want you know, richness for um, in this world where they see different cultures. I think I think these are very reassuring to me as a journalist. Taking a look at the things on the flip side, there's some negative impression that I do want to share out here. And this is about uh, two uh, 
this thing surveys, the one that I'm going to uh, speak of right now is actually conducted by Stanford, which showed that nearly 75% of people in China held a negative view of the U.S., and similarly, around 76% of the people in the United States, uh, United States reciprocated a similar view of China. When parts of media on both sides uh, continue to ratchet similar views about each other, what do you think can the media do to lower the temperatures or reverse that kind of course? As I mentioned to you, this is very interesting because if you read these surveys, you think you think the world is collapsing, right? You think, wow, the great majority of American people are host or have unfavorable uh, understand or impression about China. But if you actually go on the streets in the United States, at least in California, again, I say this, um, things were not so bad. And I'm going again in the future to other parts of the country, I hope, to get a more comprehensive and balanced view. Um, but again, coming back to these numbers, they must tell us something. And I, and I think it is important to understand why things are so bad or since when things went so bad. And if you look back at the development of such survey results or of such impressions, you can pretty much find that it's, it's, been, it's been since the beginning of the Trump presidency especially during the pandemic years that um, the American people's perception about China has uh, nosedived. And I'm, and I'm sure this is not just in the United States. If you look at other developed countries, major developed countries, it's a very similar picture. I think it has very much to do with a kind of rhetoric by politicians who were not responsible when, when they were talking about China. The you know former US President Donald Trump was telling the American people that China raped American economy. And then you have all of these um, speculation or smearing or hate speech against Asian population or about China being you know the origin of the virus or China even uh, intentionally exported virus, and then the media. A lot, a lot of people in the media were not being responsible in when they reported on China. For instance, I was engaged in this uh, debate with my Ameri former American counterpart Trish Reagan on the Fox Business, and the reason why I, um, you know, I, I, I try to argue against her position was that she was saying on her program that or she was implying that Chinese people steal, that Chinese companies were stealing American intellectual properties. And, and she was using such a generalistic, such a broad brush that it was insulting against the Chinese people in general. But when, when you have these kind of day and night ongoing propaganda against the Chinese population, it doesn't help the, under, the, the image of China in the hearts of many people. And again, let's not forget the trade war that the Trump administration was trying to, to uh, that they actually launched. And then over the past couple of years, the kind of you know freedom or democracy versus authoritarianism metaphor that's been repeated again and again, as if China you know, is a big, terrible place where the people are suffering and st stuff like that. It doesn't help. Um, on the other, so as a result, I would say as a result of all of that, you are seeing a lot of Chinese people reacting very strongly and very negatively towards the kind of rhetoric that's coming from the United States and other Western countries. Hence, the very unfavorable image or, or impression of America by the Chinese population. In terms of the role of the media, as I said, the Chinese media didn't start by, br by bashing the American um, politician or the American country or never the American population. It was a reaction to the kind of rhetoric that was very hostile against China over the over the past few years, and I was witnessing, I, I personally witnessed the development of this very fierce, very bitter tit for tat. It's not nice. I hope that kind of picture, that kind of situation, never repeats itself. Um, in terms of what to do, so that we don't, uh, so that the temperature would be would be um, not lower, that the situation will not be so intense. I think, unfortunately, our American counterparts probably have to do more. Um, they need to 
maybe step down a little bit from their seat of excellence or arrogance or thinking they hold the holy grail of uh, of judgment you know that the others are there to be judged upon they probably need to be a little bit a little bit more humble when it comes to reporting on china and maybe to some other people less lazy not so much follow following the kind of group group thinking that because china is bad because everybody says china is bad so china is bad um, then there could be more exchanges. I was very pleased that uh, I was invited on ABC and NBC Bay areas to talk about my view. For that, I am very appreciative. I hope there will be more exchanges between medias in both countries. Maybe they can come into come into China and be my guest on my show. We can also have closed door consultations, dialogues. Uh, with our American counterparts so that we understand e understand each other better. So there are things that can be done. But given the current political atmosphere in the United States, and given the kind of antagonism that is still unfolding between the two countries, I think it is going to be a long stretch to expect things to improve overnight. And now, Lucian, let me draw your attention to another survey. And this is now basically about different countries holding you know, the kind of perceptions that they have about US and China. So there's this survey conducted by Pew, which found that a set of middle-income countries like Nigeria, Indonesia, South Africa, uh, and Kenya have, substanc uh, have sub substantive favorable views of both the US and China. Many of these countries do not want to become part of the global contest involving the US and China, uh, and this is quite a trend that we've seen uh, from countries that are not mentioned out here as well. What can U.S. and China do, again I ask you, uh, in terms of meeting the expectations of such countries that do not want to get embroiled uh, in such kind of a competition? Well, uh, as a matter of fact, I was not surprised at all to see that these developing countries, these major developing countries, were having a much more favorable impression of China compared to uh, what you alluded to in your previous question. As I said, the unfavorable picture of China was very much the working of uh, relentless beating by media, by mainstream media in the West. So for these developing countries to have a better view, better impression of China, I think it is uh, is natural. And it also says a lot about China's uh, diplomacy, about China, what's, what's China doing in these countries. They These countries, and again, I would say, probably including countries such as Pakistan, uh, they have a very similar um, development stage, very similar experience as China. They understand what China is trying to do, and they understand what China is trying to um, achieve. And their prejudice, their bias against China is also much less as well. And on the other hand, through collaboration, through projects such as under the Belt and Road Initiative, um, these countries have benefited concretely from a rising China. So their um, you know, prejudice, their, their fear of China is much less. At the same time, they also in, understand the importance of preserving their own identity, given the onslaught of Western influence, because they have a very rich traditional culture, traditional uh, way of life and a way of thinking, and they want to preserve that. And that's precisely what China has been trying to do is to modernize, but still keep our own identity. In other words, to modernize in a Chinese way. Um, so in, in this sense, I think it is also very, um, very interesting that uh, um, despite the kind of efforts by many in the West, such as politicians or, or, or some in the media, these countries, they see what is happening, and they don't want to be drawn into the pseudo competition or antagonism that America wants to bring China and the United States into. They want to see that US and China live together in peace. In fact, this idea of peaceful co coexistence is very much shared by developing countries and is also a central piece of what China believes is the right way forward uh, in, in managing the relationship between the United States 
and China. So on that sense, a lot of the developing countries share similar views with China. And I wouldn't be surprised if you expand the scope of the survey and look at more developing countries, you will see China enjoy a much more favorable view in these countries as well. The fact that um, people in these countries view China and the United States on a similar level of favorability, I think that's a good thing. That's, that shows it is not a us versus you, you know, kind of picture. It is you and us. You know, we people in the world can like China, they can like America, they can like Germany, they can like the UK. You know, this is not mutually exclusive, and that is also part of partly where the richness of the country of the world comes from. So this idea of either you or me is, is not um, welcome, let's say, by countries in, in, in most part of the world. Lucian, if we look at almost 50 years back, the kind of rapprochement that took place between the United States and China, it opened up a new phase of cooperation between the two countries, and it definitely had actually created a lot of dividends for the rest of the world as well. Uh, let me then ask you, uh, we had that phase of cooperation and we saw the kind of uh, uh, fruits that created. Uh, what do you think now can the U.S. and China do to work together and sort of help create more dividends for countries that are falling in that middle income bracket? I think there are many things that China and the United States can do. Um, for instance, the leaders mentioned the field of climate change and uh, artificial intelligence, which um, is are the bright spots, I would say, in bilateral ties, which have not suffered so much the damages of the up and downs of bilateral relations over the past few years. And there are much more. Actually, um, according to the Chinese president, the area of cooperation or the area for cooperation between China and the United States have actually increased instead of decreased. And that is also why China wants to define this relationship as one of cooperation potential instead of one of competition. For instance, in terms of green development, China is now one of the world's largest producer and exporter of new energy vehicles. In that sense, China is doing its part in helping clean the world's environment, isn't it? By investing hugely um, and producing EV cars, for other parts of the world. I was in California and I visited this um, workshop invested by a Chinese company called BYD in California. That's the biggest in North America. And I see a very interesting picture where Chinese managers, and of course, with the assistance of American staff, are managing this plant where American workers are working happily making um, zero emission buses for the streets of California so that California can enjoy better environment, less emission. And both the Chinese investors are benefiting, the Chinese workers are benefiting, the American workers have a job, they're able to put their expertise into good use. And of course, you know, the people who live in that state benefit from a cleaner environment, the passengers are able to enjoy um, quality service, quality vehicles, and so on and so forth. That is a great thing. If the two countries can work out um, a set of rules on what they can do together to make the world a better place, I think that is a, a great contribution, not just to the two countries, but also setting a, an example for other countries in the world, isn't it? Um, I think... Uh, there are there are great great opportunities to opportunities to be tapped into. Yeah. Lucian, now let me draw your attention to Belt and Road Initiative and the very flagship project involving Pakistan and China, and this is China Pakistan Economic Corridor. Uh, there are reports that both countries have now entered into the second phase of this project. Uh, do you or your network plans to do or carry out any uh, activities or any initiatives to sort of create awareness, sensitize your audience, and to create more exposure about uh, the kind of developments that are taking place, particularly in these special economic zones over here. I have to say it's been a great pity that although I have appeared on Pakistani media a couple of times or in Pakistani institutions, I've never 
been to Pakistan. So it's a great pity. And I hope that <laughs> in the near future, I would have the opportunity to go. I do know that um, there are a lot of uh, uh, importance that are that is attached to Pakistan. Um, here in Beijing, I have very good relationship with uh, our Pakistani friends. And I hope that in the new, in the coming year, we would have the opportunity to go and visit, um, especially the, the corridor. I know that one of my colleagues went to Pakistan and did a very interesting story about a power plant in, in Pakistan, which was built by Chinese investor and how that power plant changed the lives of not just the workers who are employed there, but also the villagers who are living next to that power plant. Um, I have some... Um, numbers, for instance, which says that uh, this corridor has brought 25 billion uh, foreign direct invest investment to Pakistan, some um, quarter of a million jobs created, 500 kilometers of highway, 8,000 megawatts of uh, power generation capacity, and so on and so forth. So, I've, and this is despite some of the ups and downs that people have experienced in the in the implementation of the projects. So indeed, it's I think it's a there is a lot to celebrate, and definitely I think the momentum is strong. So um, I hope that there are more collaboration happening in in Pakistan with Chinese um, uh, partnership. I understand that, for instance, in the new energy sector, there are many Chinese players that are. Also collaborating with Pakistani uh, stakeholders, for instance, in the city of Karachi, you have the you have Chinese made new energy buses or new energy subways, correct me if I'm wrong, and there are motorcycles, new energy motorcycles that are also being built in collaboration with Chinese company and their Pakistani counterparts. So all of these are very encouraging. And I'm sure given the strong momentum of bilateral ties, and there will be more fruits that are delivered, not just for the business people, but really for the local people uh, so that they have concrete benefits in their hands. It's interesting you've made a mention of uh, bilateral cooperation in the area of uh, public transport as well, as well as, uh, you know, a broad array of uh, different areas where the two sides have cooperated under China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. Uh, recently, while you were visiting U.S., you also pointed out and mentioned uh, in this very interview that you did an entire episode on zero emission buses being manufactured in the U.S. by a Chinese company. Uh, 88 million people, which makes up about 38% uh, uh, of the population in cities over here in Pakistan. Uh, do you think there's a possibility that Pakistani businesses and the Chinese businesses can work together to sort of lower the carbon emissions over here in Pakistan as well, to help build more cleaner cities by introducing uh, similar kind of buses on Pakistani roads? Absolutely. I think um, there's great potential and many Chinese manufacturers already see that kind of potential. As I said, um, Chinese new vehicles comp makers are already present in Pakistan. I know Saik, uh, Saik Group, the state-owned manufacturer of automobiles, and Great Wall Vehicles have already um, opened up factories for um, assembly or parts assembly factories in Pakistan. There are also uh, the Green Line in Karachi. I understand that opened in at the beginning of 2023 in Karachi. All of their buses are from a Chinese company called Zhongtong, and then 100 buses from Suzhou in eastern China also are uh, being used since May of last year. They are using hybrid energy and there are again buses and there are more buses that are being built by China that are catering for Pakistani cities, for instance, in the city of Lahore. And also um, Chinese Jialing Group is signing, have signed a cooperation uh, agreement with uh, their Pakistani counterpart called Guman Group. Anyway, I'm just, you know, searching some Chinese media and these are already quite a bit of information I'm finding out. So I think the, the possibility is great. I think the Chinese investors are definitely seeing the opportunity that Pakistan can offer in terms of uh, developing new energy vehicles. And there's a great plus, right? We have this uh, Iron Brotherhood, which is going strong despite Again, as I mentioned, despite the ups and downs that we experienced over the past year. So um, as 
the uh, corridor project into the second year, I'm I'm looking forward to some even greater achievements. Um, I understand you're, we're talking about digital economy uh, cooperation and uh, cooperation in terms of agriculture. There's vast, vast potential. And China needs to cooperate with countries such as Pakistan, uh, such as other developing countries, because that is also where a, gr a big part of uh, growth for Chinese economy as well. Chinese people are very curious about uh, um, products, ideas from abroad, from Africa, from Southeast Asia, from everywhere. China is attracting imports. Chinese people are curious about food. Um, on the Chinese social media platform, for instance, we are able to buy products from everywhere around the world. I wouldn't be able to say every every product around the world, but uh, um, so long as there are interests, so long as um, people know about it, there is a market, there is an appetite. So there's a huge potential. And, I, and I'll be very happy to see more Pakistani. By the way, Sama, what do you think would be a great product to be sold here in China that can be very popular? What do you think would be um, a very popular product that can be exported to China from Pakistan? I think uh, there are plenty of products. Is that of the agricultural industry itself? And both the countries do actually have, um, you know, made investments uh, in this area as well. So I suppose, provided if we have uh, that built of, you know, that that area of cooperation enhanced further, and if there is perhaps more value addition in terms of agricultural products, then of course, uh, I suppose much can be done towards that end. But that's not the only area. We also have uh, Chinese cell phone manufacturers over here uh, who are assembling cell phones over here in Pakistan. So if we have uh, any surplus production, perhaps we can uh, re resend uh, the same Chinese cell phones uh, back into the Chinese market. Uh, I think sky is the limit, uh, if you ask me, provided if we put our heads together and uh, think out of the box in terms of where this cooperation can be taken forward. That's why I think positivity and brainstorming is so important. Um, let's not be daunted by the negative picture that we see on the media, you know, on our social media platforms. If you really go among the people, you see the nuance, you see the hospitality, you see the potential. And I'm very confident of uh, not just relationship between China and Pakistan and other developing countries, but also between Chinese people and American people. After this trip, I'm very confident. And Lucian, before we wrap up our conversation, my last question, and although we do tend to have uh, uh, cooperation between the media of the two countries, what would you really suggest that the two sides can do to enhance their cooperation in that sector? In the media sector, I certainly would welcome more interaction. Let's sit down. And sometimes it's better behind closed doors than, you know, open air, because behind closed doors, we really can open up and talk about, you know, much more substantive stuff and, and, and the time will not be so limited. I think that is very, very, very important. That is why I was, I was, um, I enjoyed and I learned a great deal after participating in some forums hosted by the National Defense University of Pakistan. I learned a lot about Pakistan and also about China, also about how China is perceived by the Pakistani, um, not so much in the general public sense, but you know, elites, scholars, officials, researchers, and so on and so forth, which is very important. I cannot talk to the world by just sitting in China and imagining what the world is like. I really have to understand. And, and the way to do that is, you know, to have this kind of exchange with my foreign counterparts. And even better, when you have criticism, when you have different ideas, I welcome that. One of the things I personally benefited greatly from over the 25 years of my professional career is through criticism. When people challenge me, when people say, Lucian, you're wrong, you should do it differently. That's when I probably learn the most. So I think at least we can we can do much more about that. Lucian, on this note, I would really wish that uh, your team and you yourself can come to Pakistan someday very soon. Very exclusive feature on uh, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor and other interesting areas of the culture itself. Uh, I once again thank you for taking out the time, being part of this show, and we look forward to uh, seeing you again sometime in future again. 
Thank you very much, Usama, for this op uh, for this invitation. I hope I gave uh, coherent answers. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us for this conversation with Ms. Lucian. Our team works very hard to make this work possible, and it would mean the world to us if you could like and share our content. And if you'd like to stay informed about our upcoming podcasts and other work, please hit the bell icon.